Hey everybody, my name is George Castro. I've been documenting my year of moving from traditional Linux desktops to zero trust desktops in the hope that it will help uh, people understand how these systems work so that you can have a good time. I was also in the process of moving uh, from Ubuntu to Fedora, so I kind of wanted a familiar way to move to the new world, uh, the, you know, the way the Linux desktop is going to be and um, be able to have it in a way uh, that's fun for me and I didn't want to relearn too much stuff unless I didn't have to. So this is kind of my guide to how I run Fedora Silverblue. It's not the stock uh, setup. Um, and I, I wanted to go over that because uh, a lot of people are going to do, you know, your desktops where you live. So you might want to do your own customizations and just kind of showing people what's out there. So if you've got some cool way that you're running Silver Blue, let me know. Um, so it was important to me to kind of uh, maintain a Ubuntu-like aspects to it because that's the desktop I've been using for 10 years. I've been using Unix since 1994. So I've used just about all of them. And uh, this is the best one and it's not even close. And I hope that by the end of this video, you can understand the why and uh, give it a try for yourself. But I want it, it had to look like Ubuntu for me, right? Um, so I've done some modifications here and I even got the, the cube going. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, quick disclaimer here. I did script all of this. Um, if you go to ublue.it, like you blew it. Um, I do have a script that does this thanks to the help from uh, Marco Cepi and Adam Israel and others that helped me script this out. So if you just want this, just go to ublue.it and follow the instructions uh, and then you'll have you know, especially if you're just moving from Ubuntu or something and you just, you know, want, want the George setup, uh, then you can do that. I, uh, this isn't a commercial for that whole thing. I'm just kind of going to talk about Fedora. Uh, but I did automate a bunch of stuff cause I'm in cloud. I don't believe in like doing snowflakes. So it started off as a bash script. Hopefully someday it'll be an Ansible playbook, but, um, it's working for me. So if you want to, um, check out all the stuff I'm doing and kind of copy what I'm doing and modify it for yourself. I highly encourage that. So uh, first things first, it's the desktop and I wanna talk about uh, system updates. So um, for me, system updates are one of the most important reasons to move to the, the new distro model here. I know, um, one second, there we go. I know that uh, it's, fam you know, people famously say Linux is better uh, a better client because you get to choose when not to apply security updates. Uh, I think that's awful. Um, so if I'm going to move to the new world and the file system is immutable and I can roll back both the system and the applications at a separate thing, there's no need for me not to apply a security update. So uh, by default, there's this file called Etsy RPM OS3D.conf. And in here you will find the actual OS tree update policy. I changed this to stage. Um, which is not the default. By default, your GNOME software will come up and you got to apply updates and then you do uh, the reboot. What Stage does, I changed this to Stage for a few reasons, is there's a daemon in the background that just pulls uh, the server when updates are available and then just automatically applies them to uh, the OS tree. Now, what that means is I am constantly always up to date in the background. The updates don't take place, however, until I reboot. Now, I know a lot of times people are like, wait, you know, I don't want to reboot. I don't, I don't understand why I have to reboot. Isn't that what Windows makes me do or whatever? Um, so the way I do it is I just reboot naturally, right? So if it's if it's a work machine, right, uh, work-life balance on Fridays, I shut that bad boy off. Um, for my personal machines, I just kind of got used to turning them off when I'm not using them. Um, it, laptops kind of generally have a... You know, you're not keeping the thing in suspend forever. So I feel like I'm shutting that thing off uh, on the regular and um, the updates are applied. I've been running five or six systems like this in a year um, and I had zero issues. I think there was one that I had an issue with and that's a quick rollback. To me, not applying security updates is way worse than anything that you can get by applying an update. So uh, knowing that I can quickly and easily roll back just makes this a no brainer for me. I call this sport mode for OS tree. Obviously distros don't ship like this by default, but why are you gonna buy an AMG or if you're gonna drive it in comfort mode, go for it, right? So uh, that's what I do there. The other thing I've noticed people um, sometimes get confused about is what am I supposed to be layering? So um, I layer a few things, things that you layer, um, 
you know, we, we, we keep saying that we want to keep this small so that when you, you're getting updates to all these packages, obviously the more stuff you layer, uh, that's more uh, attack surface that needs to be updated and rebooted. So if you're layering a bunch of packages that you need, um, like, you know, if you use normal, normal distros and you're just using RPM OS tree all the time and installing all these, uh, you're just kind of not doing yourselves any favors. You might as well just use a normal distro. However, we are in the middle of a transition. So sometimes that means that you got to, you know, we don't want perfect to be the enemy of good, right? So I layer VS code um, uh, because sometimes the tooling around containers and stuff isn't quite as developed yet. That's a work in progress. These are atomic systems, so you don't lose anything by layering and then removing it later. Uh, so I do code uh, and my general guideline is for if you want to layer, layer stuff that's at the system level, not at the application level. Um, look back in my blogs. I talk about this all the time. We are splitting instead of one big operating system that you install everything by root, which is bad, to a system where we have the system packages, right? Like your desktop and all that kind of stuff. And then your applications and libraries, which are in different layers. And this, for this, uh, for OS tree layering, we, we're doing this stuff at the system level. So I will put um, uh, things like tail scale, which is my VP, your VPN software, uh, usually kind of needs to be at this level. I do code and then I do distro box instead of toolbox because I prefer its features. Um, however, I've, as you notice, I've broken one of my rules right away and I have GNOME shell extensions here. This is one of those cases where um, if I'm using my computer, the GNOME versions update at their own pace, um, you know, and sometimes when a new version of Gnome is out, but I haven't upgraded to the new version of Fedora, extensions might break. So I purposely layer this to keep them locked to the version of the Fedora version I am on, especially since I'm using these modifications to kind of make it look like Ubuntu. Uh, but if you don't want to move your desktop to look anything like this and you feel the stock Gnome look is what you want, uh, you don't need to do this. Again, you know, I kind of do this because I have to, uh, it's been running fine, obviously in the back of my head. Usually when I look at layered packages, it's like when you're doing a major distribution upgrade, maybe that's a good time to say, you know, do I need to layer this? Do I need to layer that? For example, GNOME boxes I'm layering currently, uh, because sometimes I have a hard time with the flat pack, uh, being reliable to get into the VMs that I want. Obviously someday I will just unlayer this. Uh, you know, and then install the GNOME boxes flat pack to check it out. But I don't lose anything by, by switching back and forth. Um, so that's how I do that. And things like the Yaru theme, I mean, someone's going to be like, look, why are you laying, layering your theme? Um, it's because it's well maintained in Fedora and I want it to look like Ubuntu. So I just apply that. Uh, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. People will have opinions on that. Sure. Whatever works for you. Okay. Um, so the next thing I noticed uh, some people might be struggling on is your flat packs. So um, you might say, let me look what's installed here. Whoa, what is that, right? And then um, you gotta figure out how to filter by columns and things like that. So one of the things I, I, I find confusing with Fedora is they have RPMs, they have their own flat packs, and then there's the stuff that I want in FlatHub. Uh, so what I do is I totally remove the um, uh, Fedora FlatHub remote and replace all those applications, including Firefox uh, from the Flatpak um, uh, repositories instead. So if you go to flathub.org, sorry, that should be FlatHub, not Flatpak. I don't want to conflate the packaging with the uh, app store. Uh, so if you go into here and you click quick setup and uh, you click Fedora, uh, just follow this. Uh, and there's instructions out there on how, uh, how to remove uh, the flat pack, uh, for the Fedora flat packs, if you want, um, or you could just keep them as well. I mean, uh, there, there's some use cases for that for everybody. For me, um, I want my base system to come from the distro and I want my applications to go to flat hub and I'm, I'm purposely putting up a fence in between those things. Um, so that's just how I prefer to use it. So my Firefox actually has, um, uh, actually comes from Firefox itself via, uh, via flat hub. And one of the things I did want uh, to point out is, and, uh, for some of these, instead of me showing you the command line, I'm going to show you just, uh, how I do it in my script here is one of the very first things I do is I remove, uh, that Firefox because it does indeed come on the base image for silver blue. So you do an RPM OS 
uh, override remove Firefox if you want to just swap them out. Otherwise, you'll have two icons. And if you're the kind of person that maybe you want to follow um, uh, the distro Firefox because it has Wayland integration and all the stuff they enabled, uh, but you also want the official upstream one, uh, you could just use both if, if you want. Um, but I prefer to just do a normal swap there. Um, I did forget for other updates, um, I do have a system D unit for uh, doing automatic flat pack updates. So uh, I just set it to run flat pack update. Why this up updates my applications um, separately from my system, but uh, usually, you know, throughout the week, my applications are getting way more updates than my system is. So, you know, I'll always have the latest applications and those just come in, uh, you know, whether you need a reboot or not, just like the next time you launch the app, it'll traditional kind of traditional Linuxy things here. Um, yeah, this is ugly, whatever. Um, uh, by default, I set mine to update every four hours. Um, this is to mirror the default cadence of Ubuntu's updates. So my computers are all set. Everything automatically updates. And because I can unlimited, I have unlimited rollbacks. I don't feel like I'm losing anything, uh, but I always have the latest stuff and it's, it's pretty great. So, all right. So we've covered that. Um, the next thing you'll know is sometimes people say, um, oh no, my extensions don't work. Right. And that's because um, the browser is sandbox and by default, it's not going to let you go on a website and change your desktop, right? Like just because we've always done it that way. Uh, so instead what I use is this excellent tool called extension manager, which is not extensions. Yeah. This is a, a separate tool. You'll find this on flat hub as well. It's one of the first things I install. And this is where I get the cube. You can do the cute things like your windows you know, lighting on fire when you close them. I want to bring a little bit of that old school, old school Ubuntu with me. But this is where I get the setup for, um, you know, the dock. I'm using dash to dock. I don't know why this button is here in the middle. I don't know. Um, that's, that's like a recent bug. I'm going to have to investigate that. So any GNOME extensions that you use here are the trick. If you want to make it look exactly like this and you just don't want to, um, you know, sit there and set it up by hand, I do have a script in you blue that kind of does this what i did is i ran a deconf um dump on an ubuntu desktop and modified it to work on here so it's as close to an ubuntu uh, desktop as i could get it with configs uh without without changing too much and i even install the font and all that kind of things if if you're into that so um it's definitely a, a i just got used to using the extension manager uh, it has a little browser, it has search. So when you read about a cool extension, you could just type it in here. And I think, I think it's a, it's a really uh, nice way to go. There's a project called flatline. Let's see if I have it. Um, oh, that's a blog talking about flatline. Here we go. Um, if you do prefer that setup of clicking on a web store to install the packaging, um, this project called Flatline, you can add it in Chrome and Firefox or whatever, and that will give you the install, click the button uh, functionality. So you can definitely check that out. I don't personally use it, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm glad it exists. You know what I mean? Uh, so we got that. And then the last bit is that I want to cover today is the um, CLI experience. So I, uh, I use DistroBox on my channel. Uh, go back a few videos. I made a video of my entire DistroBox setup, uh, but that's the concept of using... Uh, other distributions as your terminal CLI. So, um, you know, in here I can install any of the stuff. Oh, I already have that installed. Uh, what's a, I don't know. Do I have HTOP in here? I do. Uh, what is something I can, NVIM? Sure. No. Huh. Anyway, I've been living in this in a while, so I've, so uh, it's obviously grown in here. What this does is transparently mount my home directory and give me the CLI that I want. I keep around Fedora toolboxes, um, uh, you know, and then I have a system one that doesn't go into toolboxes at all. Uh, but by default, I go, uh, when I open a terminal, I'm always in an Ubuntu container and that's how I kind of roll. Uh, this, this might take some getting used to people. Obviously, if you're like a new Linux user and all you want is install Steam and OBS and all those good, that good stuff, um, 
you could do that and not have to worry about this. You could just use uh, the terminal that comes with it. Uh, if you're an advanced user, use cloud, or you're like a system administrator and stuff, this gets really, really powerful because um, I am able to kind of use different user spaces. So when someone says, hey, you shouldn't use this, you can get better packages in Arch or this other distro or whatever. I can do that. Uh, I don't have Arch toolboxes because um, I, I work out, you know, my project works on LTS stuff. So uh, that's what I do. But anything available in the Ubuntu archives, I can get here. Uh, but I also do keep a, a Fedora one around, um, uh, you know, in case I need to use it. Obviously, I don't use it often because I need to update this from 35 to 36. But it's nice to know it's there. And it's also nice to know that you can run just about any software on any Linux distro everywhere. So day-to-day, uh, -to -day, it you know, GUI-wise, it's basically GNOME, like, you know, you know how to use it. Obviously, I add, I add my Ubuntu-isms uh, to it. Uh, so other than that, I mostly just use it. There's zero maintenance. There's like just zero maintenance. I go a little bit um, more hardcore in, in some of those deconf keys. I actually shut off a lot of the notifications that um, uh, GNOME software tells you about updates. And I just have it all silently running in the background like a Chromebook, right? Like that is the leading uh, use case that I'm chasing after. So hopefully this, this tour will help you. Um, it's not a beginner's tour. I know I kind of wanted to go over my config, um, but I figure it's a start and hopefully it'll, it'll motivate other people to make, you know, beginner guides and stuff like that. So if you're a content creator and want to go help, you know, do that stuff, we kind of need it. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can always leave a comment in the video and I'd be happy to show you or do follow up content. If there's something, if you want to see, um, I do blog about this. Uh, ipsydanger.com. I'll leave a link down below. And I kind of talk about all of the myths that you might have heard. Oh, no, it's wasting disk space. It's not. That's just made up. Um, and I, I, I try to go through and kill as many of the, uh, as much misinformation out there as I can. And if you want the automated experience, you can try that. Uh, give me a pull request. Let me know. Uh, let me know how you dig it uh, or create your own. Uh, but either way, happy Linux desktoping. And oh, last thing, Steam, OBS, all of it works. Uh, there's a little bit of config. There is actually one last tool uh, that I knew, need to talk about and that's Flat Seal. This enables you to adjust the permissions of the flat packs. Now, some people wonder, why do we need this? Well, in old school Linux distro lands, and this is awful, um, you install your packages as root, which means they have access to all your stuff, right? Modern systems, that's not gonna fly, right? By default now, applications uh, come with limited sets of permissions and it's uh, up, up to them to ask you the permission that they need and then you say yes or no. Some apps are really good at this. Obviously, we're in the middle of a transition. Some apps are just get confused. Um, so we do need tools like this for you to be able to, to figure that out. So usually if you have um, any kind of friction in an app that you're installing versus the old way, of just giving it access to everything is uh, managing these sets of permissions, right? Um, ideally, in, in an ideal world, it looks, and it will look like it does on other Linux devices like your phone, which is, you know, hey, applications wants access, you know, to your pictures, yes, no, and then you hit yes, and then you can add custom stuff if you want, instead of just letting applications splat anywhere on the disk, um, which is the way Linux distributions have been doing it, and um, as you've seen uh, out in the wild, uh, that's not really working anymore. So that's why the, uh, a lot of us are moving to systems like this and kind of doing our best to try to explain uh, why we want to do this. Um, so definitely check that out. Uh, that is a mission in my part. I'll make sure that I link that in the video description. So with that, um, have a good time and we will see you on the internet.